Welcome to the Navigators of Bible class. We are currently studying the chronology of the life of Jesus, and we are just about to the end of that. Um, we're going to look at a few things today, such as the illegal trials that, uh, of Jesus in that last day, uh, the day in which he was crucified. And uh, last week we began studying the events of that Wednesday, uh, the Passover day, uh, Nisan 14, in which the Passover lamb was killed. It's also the day in which the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world was sacrificed. Uh, so we began studying the events of that day kind of started off with the preparation before the day. And remember, the Jewish day begins at our 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., uh, the Jewish day, and then you have the evening, and then you have the morning. Uh, that's the way that that works. So, in the afternoon before... before um, uh, that Passover began, they began to look for a place to have their Passover dinner, and then they got the place, and then they had their Passover dinner, and uh, during that time there was a lot of events such as the washing of the feet of the disciples by Jesus, uh, the installation of the ordinance of the Lord's Supper to remember His death, Till he comes, uh, the announcement that Judas would betray him, uh, and we also uh, talked about Judas the betrayer, and then after they sing sing a hymn, they go to the walk, uh, they walk to the garden of Gethsemane, which is in the Mount of Olives. During that time, Jesus is teaching them, comforting them. It's like his last shot at them before he's crucified. And you'll find what he said in John 15, uh, 16 and 17. Those in there are recorded by John and not, uh, not very much by the other Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, then in the garden we had the Lord's Prayer in John 17. That is the real Lord's Prayer where he prayed for his disciples and for us as well those who would come to know him. And uh, we see uh, that the betrayal by Judas, we're going to hit some of these things really quickly uh, because not only can you read them and study them, you've already read and studied them, but, but Judas is betrayed. We see that in John 18. <clears throat> John 18 uh, verses 1 through 14, we see his betrayal. Um, and, of course, Judas has already conspired with the uh, chief priests. And we see that there. And then uh, we see the betrayal is with a kiss, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, I because the kiss uh, was what was the method that the old Baal worshipers during the time of Ahab and Jezebel before and after them, those who worshipped Baal kissed it. They kissed it. Uh, what is it? Hosea 13 verse 2 says, let them that worship kiss the calves. You know, like the golden calf. Uh, so it's interesting that he betrays Jesus with a kiss. That was not only an identification of who Jesus was, but a big slap in his face, as it were. Um, uh, so, and we, we know about Judas' remorse. Uh... He went out and hanged himself. Okay? 
And Christ's last miracle in the garden was the healing of Malchus, uh, found in Luke 22, 51. He was the high priest's servant. You remember, Peter whacked off his ear, and Jesus picked it up and healed it. Uh, healed his ear. That's the last recorded uh, miracle that Jesus did. And it's interesting that he did it in front of those who took him captive, prisoner, arrested him. Uh, at this point, I want to give you a handout. Uh, I've got mine here somewhere already. I better put that up there. This um, is a uh, print out front and back of the Ill illegal facts of uh, Jesus' trial. Um, it's very interesting that um, he was tried by both the Jews and the Romans. And it was, it was the, it was the one, yeah. uh, it, it's interesting that the, uh, he was tried three times by the Jews and three times by the Romans. Guess who found him guilty? The Jews. The Jews. Every trial found him guilty. The Romans, all three trials, found him innocent. So when you hear that, you know, the, he was uh, he was tried by both the Romans and the uh, here, take one of the uses. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it and grade it. Oh, <laughs> This, I got one left. Does anybody want an extra one? Okay. Um, this, uh, this was uh, just one I, a website that I took these off. There are some websites that say there's 20 and more instances of the legality of his trial. Uh, some say there was 10. So there, there's all kind of... Uh, Things. One fellow was a lawyer and he wrote a whole dissertation on it. Very interesting. But I, I, I decided to print this one because it was sort of concise. Now keep in mind on this one that um, these particular items were violations of Mosaic law. They were violations of Jewish custom. They were violations of Jewish uh, judicial uh, process uh, that the Sanhedrin and the other um, legal Jewish legal bodies professed to hold uh, to, uh, professed to abide by. Any, well, any way I look at that, I'm in that sentence with a preposition. I hate that. <laughs> okay. Uh, going on into this, if you'll turn to Matthew 26, uh, you find these items of, Jew, uh, of his trial in um, all for the Gospels, but uh, we kind of use Matthew sort of as a uh, starting place, and we see in Matthew 26, the first one is a hearing before Caiaphas, and you see that um, uh, starting in verse... Uh, No. 57. 47. 47. Okay. 57. <laughs> I'm glad I put that up there. 
Uh, this took place actually before sunrise. So if we're looking at this uh, clock here, uh, 6 p.m. they began their last supper, and uh, he was with them here. They walked to the garden, uh, and somewhere in the middle of the night here, they take him, uh, or they arrest him. And so it's during this time here, somewhere in here, that they bring him before the high priest, uh, Caiaphas. So this was uh, in, before sunrise, and that in itself was illegal. They did not permit a trial to occur uh, uh, at night. And they also, it was a, the trial was to be in a public place. The Mosaic Law said that the judicial things were to happen at the gates. At the gates. In other words, where people were. So the trials, all trials would be public trials, not private trials. Uh, we notice in verse 59 and 60 of, of Matthew, it says, Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none, in other words, that were truthful. And last came to false witnesses. Now, uh, Mark has a very interesting thing to say about this. In verse 55, it says, For many uh, well, in verse 55, the chief priests are looking for false witnesses. Verse 56, for many bear false witness against him, but their witnesses, their witness agreed not. Agreed not. One of the things that they had to do was the witnesses against a person, it had to, you know, jive. It had to, it had to be the same. If you have one that said this and one that said that, you know, that's why they take uh, uh, people into different interrogation rooms. You know, a couple of guys held up a store. So they they interrogate one in one room, they interrogate another in another room to see if there's any conflicts in their story. Well, there was conflicts in these uh, the stories of these witnesses. And that in itself was illegal. By the way, if a false witness uh, in a trial uh, was brought, the false witness, the one that perjured himself, was to receive the punishment that the accused was to get. Mm. We know that didn't happen. Plus the fact that the witnesses against a person uh, in, a, in a capital crime were the ones who were to take the first stone and throw at the uh, convicted uh, person. So we don't see any of that in here. Anyway, in verse 63, we're back in uh, Matthew now. At verse 63, the high, the high priest uh, uh, comes up and says, uh, Tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. There's a lot of people that don't think Christ ever claimed deity. <laughs> and yet what Christ answered the high priest was this, Thou hast said. And he goes on to really uh, turn the screws here. He said, Nevertheless I say unto you, after, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So he also predicts to this high priest his second coming, right there. And uh, that really got to them. In verse 65, the high priest rent his clothes, which also violated uh, the law. The high priest was not to... Uh, no, it says it in this thing. The high priest is not allowed to grandstand. 
Caiaphas rent his clothes and accused Christ of blasphemy. You find in Leviticus 21 verse 10 that uh, he did something right there that was uh, illegal according to the Mosaic law. Not just custom, not just practice, but actually in the Mosaic law. So Christ identifies himself in verse 45, prophesies his return. And then the high priest in verse 63 to 66 accuses him of blasphemy. That was the crime that the Jews brought against Christ. Blasphemy. And they said it warrants death. You find that in verse 60, 66. Yes. Um, so at this point, before Caiaphas, then they began to assault their accused. Uh, they spit upon him. They they hit him in the face. They did all kind of stuff to him. And that was illegal. That was illegal uh, because in the, in the Jewish law, if someone was accused, they were not to be basically touched until conviction. You'll find that according to uh, Jewish judicial practice, we get a lot of our um, legal customs and, uh, and, and even in our constitution from the Judeo system here. And this is one of the ones that a person is innocent until proven guilty is a thing that goes all the way back to Jewish practice. A lot of our principles are that way. That's why we uh, have such a tremendously powerful constitution because it's grounded in God's word and I might say those that are trying to knock down the constitution are not only going against our founding fathers they're going against God's word okay all right uh, then in verse 69 to 75 we see Peter's denial we know all about that that's just one thing that uh again proves that this was at night because after the denial, what happened? The rooster crowed. Well, the rooster crows at dawn. So all this took place at night. Verse uh, Chapter 27, verse 1 in Matthew, it's a conspiracy. They conspired against him. And there is a uh, scripture, I, I didn't put it in the uh, in the thing, but it, it, it talks about in their legal thing that they are not to conspire. They are to uh, respond to witnesses or to a witness who comes and makes a charge. Here, the witnesses are not making a charge. The chief priests are making the charge and they're looking for people to back up what they say. So this is all messed up legally. Um, they then delivered him to Pilate in verse 2. Uh, verse 1, when the morning was come, uh, they decided that, well, we, we want to kill him. So let's send him to Pilate, the governor. They bound him and sent him to Pilate. So... The first appearance here with Caiaphas uh, results in their saying he is worthy of death. At this point, Judas goes out and hangs himself in verse 3 to 10 when he sees this. Okay, continuing, we have the first hearing before Pilate. I like the account in Luke 22, Luke chapter 22 before Pilate. Uh, you see this in verse uh, verse 63 verse 
No, no, no. Uh, he's before Caiaphas in verse 66. So uh, Luke 23 actually is where he's before Pilate. It's interesting that they bring him before the Romans to kind of put a rubber stamp on their sentence of death. And of course this backfires. Oh, by the way, uh, Matthew doesn't mention Herod in this. Luke does. He goes to Pilate first and then to Herod. Uh, this was after dawn. See, the attempt to make it legal because up to that point it was not legal because it was at night. Uh, Judas, 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 Jesus is then accused of treason in one verses 1 and 2. Um, so they've changed the the whole thing from blasphemy to treason against Caesar. They figure, well, this way we can get our death sentence. So obviously they were not concerned about justice. They were concerned about vengeance. And the Bible says for envy they uh, brought him up. Um, then the Pilate says, are, are you the king of the Jews? I think he was just kind of mocking him when he said this. And of course Jesus said, I am. And then Pilate says, I find no fault in him. And pawns him off to Herod. So in the first Roman trial, no fault is found. He goes to Herod. The hearing before Herod in Luke 23, uh, Herod is actually glad to see see Jesus because he'd heard about all the miracles and stuff that Jesus did uh, so he questioned him with many words this took a while uh, but Jesus said nothing said nothing and um, the chief priests and, and the scribes accused him to Herod in verse 10 then Herod he mocks Jesus puts a royal robe on him and sends him back to Pilate. So he didn't he didn't want to get into this. And later we find out that Pilate uh, was told by Herod that he was innocent. And we'll see this in this slide here. Pilate called it called the accusers, repeated their charges again, and said he found no fault. Pilate, for the second time, finds no fault. And he also said that Herod found no fault in verse 15 of, of Luke 23. Verse, verse 15, he said, even Herod found no fault in him. So he says, well, let's just, let's just beat up on him, chastise him, and then we'll release him. Um, but the people demanded Barabbas, verse 18. The whole thing was that they were going to release a prisoner uh, at this festival, at this uh, um, uh, Passover uh, time. It was custom that they would do this. It wasn't legal, but it was custom. So they, they said, well, we'll give Barabbas, and then Christ will still be uh, on the hook. Uh, the second hearing before Pilate, Pilate's wife, warns him in Matthew back in Matthew verse 27 Pilate's wife warns him about Christ they said I have suffered many things in a dream because of this man and so uh, Pilate does feel the pressure here uh, but um, and, and his wife also said he's just says, don't have anything to do with this just man in verse 19. Uh, and Pilate says, uh, okay, I'll release Barabbas. What should I do with Jesus? And they said, crucify him. And then verse 23 says, why? What evil hath he done? Over and over, this Roman says that Jesus is not guilty of the crime. Uh, and, of course, you know, verse 24, he said, look, I don't have anything to do with this. I'm just going to wash my hands of it. And, yes, Jim, 
You can see here where a few agitators can get a, uh, a crowd of people worked up to do something that they shouldn't have done. Yep. And it's still going on even today. That is true. Uh, so Jesus or Barabbas, they choose Barabbas. He says, what do I do with Christ? They say, crucify him. Pilate says, what evil has he done? And then Pilate washing, washed his hands, said he was just. Three Romans trials said that he was innocent. Yes? Um, based on the fact that Jesus said he was the king of the Jews, wouldn't that be something against what the Roman law? Uh, it, it would be, except, uh, was it Herod or Pilate now that asked him that? I think it was uh, Herod. Uh, and and I think he was, uh, he knew that Jesus was a prophet. He was a preacher. He was kind of like uh, John the Baptist in many ways. And he did not consider him a threat, nor did he consider the statement of Jesus to be a threat. Matter of fact, when they nail the sign on the top of his cross, this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, they did it in a mocking way. It was not that they recognized him as such, but it was Pilate's way of sticking it to the Jews because they put him in this situation. In Luke, it says that Pilate asked, Art thou king of the Jews? Jesus okay. didn't say, I am. He mm -hmm. said, Thou sayest it. Yeah. In other words, you know, you're saying that. He, he asserted that what he said, he agreed with, yes. Okay, then we come down to this phrase, and it's something that could be preached on and on and on a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the people said, his blood be on us and on our children. They didn't realize it, but they put a curse on themselves and on their children that remains to this day and will remain until finally they accept Him as Messiah and Christ. At that point... God washes away that iniquity. But up until then, the, His blood is on them. Numbers 35 mm -hmm. verses 30 through 34 talks about that, uh, the, the fact that these, when someone that is innocent is convicted, that it, it will have that effect on them. So we have the situation here where they have cursed themselves, the people have. And God is long-suffering. We understand that. And after Jesus was resurrected, went back to his Father in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, God allows Peter and some of the other disciples to preach to Israel once again. That's their last chance. Look, you can make this right. And Peter said, you have killed the one uh, that was sent to you, the just one. And uh, Stephen says, you're guilty of his murder and giving them a chance to repent. They didn't, and then they were put on the back burner from Acts 8 to this day, doesn't mean Jews, it doesn't mean that they cannot be saved. As individuals, anyone can come to know Christ as Savior, whether they're Jew or Gentile. Paul is very clear about that. But as a nation, Israel has been put on the back burner. They are still in denial of Jesus Christ. You can be persecuted in Israel today for having a Bible that contains the New Testament. Yes? Wasn't there another place in the Old Testament where God puts them on the back burner because of their choices? and what? Well, doing? that was the Babylonian captivity. But that, there's nothing after that. Uh, 
Oh. He judged them, but he did not quit working with them as a nation until this time. Okay. At this time, uh, I can't remember the exact verse, but they said he will seek a people after his own name, a Christian. Okay, moving on. The conclusion, we've already mentioned this, is that there were three trials by the Jews. Each one found him guilty. There were three trials by the Romans, and they found him innocent. And yet, he was crucified in the most illegal situation that we could ever put our finger on and he was he was crucified if you have this uh, how many of you have these uh, uh, copies of these papers if you'll turn to this one here now I know y'all don't have these do you uh, we'll try to get some more somewhere to give to you this one is the um, the time frame of the crucifixion. And so what we'll do is as you're looking at that, we'll come over here to our clock and we'll see that this is where they had the, their, their supper and then in the garden and then he was taken and, and before the high priest. Finally at here he was taken to Pilate, to Herod, to Pilate. And by this time they... Uh, send him off to be crucified. And you'll see that uh, the crucifixion takes place at the third hour. The third hour in the Jewish day is 9 a.m. The sixth hour of the Jewish day is our noon or 12 p.m. The third uh, at 3 o'clock is the ninth hour of the, uh, uh, of the Jewish day. And we see he was crucified around the third hour. And about the sixth hour, something happened. Do you know what happened? Dark, dark, darkness. Darkness. Uh, it was upon the face of the land, but I'm... I, seriously think it was not just on the land. I think the entire universe went dark because Jesus cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When Jesus was separated from his Father, remember, separation is death. Okay? And so he was separated from his Father and for three hours of darkness, Jesus paid our sin penalty. So much has been uh, talked about for his physical suffering. The nails, the spear, this, that, and the, the beating and all this. But we don't often hear messages about his spiritual suffering. Okay. And it was here that he spent, keep in mind, he is an eternal being. He is the Son of God. He is not limited by time. So during these three hours, he suffered an eternity in hell for each and every person who has ever lived. The worst part is that he was separated from his father because of our sin. That's it. Exactly. And at the ninth hour, what did he say? It is finished. It's finished. At that point, he paid it all. Okay, so uh, at that point, 
into the Father's hand, he commends his spirit, and they, uh, uh, the Romans, making sure he was dead, thrust the spear into his side, and yes, he was, and uh, from then on, you have the activities of him being taken down and buried, and we'll get into that next week, and the resurrection. Uh, look these over. They're very, very interesting. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his sacrifice for us. Lord, how undeserving we are. We pray now that you would bless your word in the service following in Jesus' name. Amen.